Welcome to The Past People, where I will talk about the people of the past. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories, and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them. John Proctor was originally from Ipswich. He owned a well-performing farm with his father. In 1666, he moved to Salem, where he bought part of a new farm. He was a large man, both in height and size, with a great force and energy. He was a very outspoken man, and it was this that would eventually get him accused of being a witch and lead to his murder. He was outspoken in his opinion that the accusers and the proceedings of witches was a scam, despite the hysteria in Salem at the time. It was just a matter of time before the 60-year-old merchant found himself in the crosshairs of Salem's paranoia. It was this type of outspoken criticism of the afflicted that caused Proctor to be accused. His wife was then accused and questioned, of which he fought to prove and defend her innocence. He stood by her during the questioning while the judge berated her. This is when he noticed that the questions were changing and were becoming increasingly aimed at John. It was during this questioning that he also was named as a witch. John Proctor was the first male to be named as a witch in Salem. Witchcraft was thought to run in the family and therefore all of his children were also accused. His wife Elizabeth and Elizabeth and John's sister also were accused of being witches. Although tried and condemned, Elizabeth avoided execution because she was pregnant. Those that lived and accused witches were also under the spotlight and therefore Mary Warren, a 21-year-old maidservant who lived with the Proctor family, would later be named as a witch. Mary began to develop fits while living with the family and this was one of the telltale signs of witchcraft at the time. John did not believe in any such thing, so he would allegedly try to beat these out of her. Even if he didn't beat her, he certainly threatened beatings and worse if she didn't stop the fits. This had angered and upset his maid Mary, and so when she was accused of being a witch, she tried to shift the focus and the blame from herself to John by confirming he was performing witchcraft. John was trialled on the 5th of August, he was viciously murdered by hanging on the 19th of August only two weeks later. Proctor pleaded at his execution for a little respite of time. He had written a letter to the clergy of Boston during his imprisonment in July to ask the clergy of Boston to move the trial to a different place or to appoint a new judge that would not believe in witchcraft in order to acquit him. He claimed he was not fit to die and his plea was, of course, unsuccessful. In 17th century society, it would not have been uncommon for a man so violently tempered as Proctor to feel that he had not yet made peace with his fellow man or his god. In addition, it is thought that he died inadequately reconciled to his wife, since he left her out of the will that he drew up in prison. Perhaps due to avoiding execution, she abandoned him while he was on trial. Proctor's family was given £150 in 1711 for his execution and his wife's imprisonment. For the most part, the men of Salem Village were involved in the blaming, trying and convicting of young women, whose abnormal behaviour and conventional accusations were at the centre of the trials. But soon, men like Proctor were among those being accused, often by neighbours who had long-standing grudges against them. George Burroughs, another of the accused men, was a minister. He had borrowed money from a local family and took years to pay back his loan. Though he did repay it, the rivalry with the family continued and Burroughs moved out of Salem. When accusations of witchcraft started to spread through his old town, its residents turned against their old minister. The judge asked Burroughs when he last took communion, which he couldn't remember, and asked how many of his children were baptised, which he only answered that the eldest was. For a minister, the fact that he couldn't remember the last time he took communion and that only some of his children were baptised did not reflect well on him. His secretive manner didn't help and made it seem like he was hiding something. Before his execution, he recited the Lord's Prayer, 
and this surprised his accusers as it was believed to be impossible for a witch to do. This led to onlookers demanding his immediate release, but he was viciously murdered anyway. Those that were not involved in accusing others were often accused themselves. John Willard, Salem's deputy constable, developed doubts about the guilt of some of the so-called witches. When he communicated those concerns, accusers turned to him instead. John's wife's grandfather, Bray Wilkins, suffered from kidney stones. When he asked a local woman for treatment, she told him that his illness was likely due to witchcraft. Wilkins recalled that Willard had looked at him strangely and decided that he had caused the problem. Then Wilkins' grandson, Daniel, suddenly died. And Wilkins claimed that Willard was responsible. The Putnams, the same family that held a grudge against Minister Burroughs, accused John for killing their baby while babysitting years before, when she had died at just a few months of age. These grudges all led to accusations of witchcraft, and he was hanged along with Proctor, Burroughs and another man, George Jacob Sr. The most horrifying and vicious murder of Salem's male accused of witchcraft is that of Giles Corey, an 81-year-old man who refused to plead his innocence or guilt when he was accused of witchcraft. Instead of waiting for him to enter a plea, they decided to torture him for days by pressing him between two heavy stones until he died. Welcome to The Past People, where I will talk about the people of the past. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them. Mm -hmm.